So last time we talked about this assignment of this, if you start with the scheme S locally, almost a finite type, you attach to it this category of incoherent sheaves. So in fact this, so the reason this was invented, first of all this was invented simultaneously or quasi-simultaneously by many different groups for different reasons. And so, and the way I came across it was not because of Langlands. So it's, I didn't know that this would fix um, the problem in Langlands correspondence. My reasons were different and I'm going to explain what they were. So the reasons are the following. So yesterday, I mean, not yes, last week, we said that if you have a morphism x to y, there is a nicely behaved functor of direct image in this context. Direct image, yes. And So you don't need properness? No, it's direct image and it's defined, we gave a kind of a definition, namely you take an object of co, you regard it as an object of quasi-co, you move it, apply the usual direct image, and then you notice, aha, it actually is in D plus and therefore it can be lifted to int co. That was the formula. So it's designed so that this diagram commutes, where I, remem I remind that psi was this natural functor going from int co to quasi co. You embed co into quasi coherent sheaves and then you index tend. So this functor is nice if you behave nicely with it. If you start doing something not good, it will betray you. Namely, so remember that the, in the eventually co-connective case, there was also left adjoint. So and if you embed quasi-coherent sheaves into coherent sheaves, and this upward-looking diagram will not commute. So nice functor, but be careful with it. Okay, but in addition to pullbacks, uh, to push forward, one actually wants to have pullbacks. So if f is proper, <coughs> you want to create this a joint pair, so proper. And of course you, you can do it within quasi coherent sheaves, but something bad will happen. So, so f up a shriek, so let me write it, let me write just usual quasi coherent sheaves. So this is the usual direct image, and this is its right adjoint. It exists for some general reasons. However, so, however, is what's called not continuous. And I remind you what continuous means. So continuous means that does not commute with infinite direct sums. So, it, so there is no problem on D plus, I suppose. Pardon me? On D plus, it is a, it causes on D bigger than equal to something. Yeah, but, but D plus is not closed under direct sums. I know, okay, you take D bigger than equal to something. Yeah, but I don't want to do that. I want to do the, I want to do the whole thing. And then, so let me tell you why it doesn't commute with direct sum, infinite direct sums. So, namely, we have the following lemma. I actually stated um, one half of it already. Suppose we have a pair of adjoint functors, f and g, as, as usual, one that's above is the left adjoint, and I'm always in the world of categories with arbitrary direct sums. So, if g is continuous, let me say it like this, and we said it already, then 
f sends compacts to compacts. And b, if c is compactly generated, this is if and only if. And so in this situation, it's easy to see that if you have a proper map, there is no reason that it would send compact guys, namely the perfect guys in X, to perfect guys in Y. Take the inclusion of a singular point in, in Y, and then you'll get the image of a skyscraper will not be perfect. But the, but the question of, of uh, yes. you, you can limit the category in some way. And no, but what is the point with respect to the original problem of the geometric long lens? Yeah. So let's see if you take a curve of genus uh, at least two. Mm -hmm. So this is impossible to have a, uh, a less uh, general, maybe less complete statement by bounding categories on both sides. Uh, it's impossible because this functor is of infinite. Even in arbitrary genus, the Langlands equivalence is of unbounded. Yeah, it's in, it's 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 of unbounded amplitude. In, yeah, well, at least in, one, in the bad side. Um, so, if you take the constant sheaf on Bungie, yeah. it will go on the spectral side to something which is, uh, goes infinitely to the left, to D minus. So, you, so therefore, you don't want to cut D minus because you will lose one of the main players. You lose the constant sheaf, so you don't want to do that. So, for that reason, we want to work with categories these big categories. Okay, so, so therefore, this will not be continuous, but <coughs> in the analogous situation here, so again, the right adjoint will exist for tautological reasons, and it will be continuous because of point B of the lemma. So now let me say a few words. Why do I insist so much on having continuous functors? Why do I, why do I care? So there are two reasons. One is very practical and, one, and the other is even more practical. So why continuous functors? So answer one is that if the functor is discontinuous, it's very difficult to compute anything. So namely, so say it's, it's your functor, and suppose C is generated by a bunch of objects. Generated means that every other object can be obtained as an uh, iteration of procedures of taking direct sums and cones. If your functor is continuous, so you have the algorithm of how to extend, your, if you know what your functor does on the given collection of objects, you know what how to extend it everywhere. Well, just because... You have a control. No, I have, I have control, yes. It's manageable. If the functor is discontinuous, if I, if I know what my functor does in the generating set, I really cannot say much. So... And also, I suppose there are some... I'm not sure, but in, in usual algebraic geometry, the, the functor, of course, f of per streak is like in Golden State duality, where it has many properties in particular, Obvious ones like you can restrict to opens and you get the same upper, upper shake. And I suppose that when you do this infinite things, you can lose some of the trivial uh, facts, like that you can restrict to an open on the source or on the. No, that, that, that's still fine. It's still fine? Th these things are still fine. But we'll get there actually in, in a second. So let me just say that have more control. But here is kind of, well, maybe a better reason. So you can consider this world of DG categories and continuous functors. So the, <coughs> the main observation is that this is, these guys can be tensored up. So this is actually a symmetric monoidal category. So if you have C and D, you can create their tensor product, which is another category of the same kind. So let me give an example. So if C is 
A modules, where A is associative algebra, and D is B modules, then C tensor D will be A tensor B modules. Again, I'm talking about all modules, and so and so it turns out that this operation of tensor product gives you a lot of power. So you can do a lot of things, and later on in today's talk we'll see some of, some of these things. So for example, typical example, if you have an algebra object inside this, i.e. it's an associative algebra within this monoidal category, if you have a left module and a right module, you can tensor them up over A and get yet another category. So this gives you a power to produce a lot of new categories. Some, some construction that, well, in this case you knew what you wanted to get, will be A tensor B modules, but in, sometimes you don't have an explicit formula and some categories that you wanted to exist will exist because of this thing. And this is an operation which is well defined or? Yes, it's, no, it's a well defined, so I'm saying that this category has a symmetric monoidal structure. And it's really functorial only with respect to continuous maps. If you have C1 mapping to C2, then C1 tensor D will map to C2 tensor D if the functor from C1 to C2 was continuous. It will not map if the functor was discontinuous. And what is the tensor over A? What is Same thing. So this is a monoidal category. If you have a le and you have an algebra object, if you have a left module and a right module, you just may attempt to take the tensor product. It's a well-defined operation in a monoidal category. If you so, so A is a kind of an algebra. Yeah, A is so it's an algebra object inside D DG cat continuous. Well, AKA monoidal category. monoidal DJ category. So, and if I were asked to define what I mean by a monoidal DJ category, I will refer to Lurie's definition of this tensor product, and I will say it's an algebra object in this, in, in this monoidal category. So, monoidal DJ categories are algebra objects in here. Uh, algebra object in the monoidal category? Of, of DG categories. But the mo when you say monoidal category, it's not in the very old sense of usual category. No, no, I'm saying that this is a monoidal category because of this operation. No, no but you see, there is an old sense of monoidal category. No, it's just monoidal category. Yes, it's, yeah, it's a, we live in an infinity world, yes. <laughs> yeah. In some model for infinity <laughs> Well, in, in the infinity world, and then again there are Yes. Sorry, what's the link with continuous So the operation of tensor product is only con functorial with respect to continuous functors. If you have C1 to C2, you will not be able to tensor up this morphism unless your functor was continuous. Okay, so going back to this, so we still want to define, if you have a map, we want to define f up a shriek from int co x, int co y to int co x. Well, in the following way. So you want that if f is an open embedding, you want f up a shriek to be. the left adjoint of the functor direct image. And if F is proper, is a proper map, you want F upper shriek to be the right adjoint. And in general, I mean, when you want to attempt the construction, of course, what you will do by Nagata, you will factor your morphism <coughs> like so. And you will say that f up a shriek is first f bar up a shriek times 
j upper shriek, and you know what they are in each case. And of course, you can't do this in infinite setting. I mean, you just can't define functors, but say, oh, hey, okay, just choose a factorization. Um, there is infinite number of homotopy consistencies that you have to check. Yet, you can set up a machinery using this factorization, so you can organize a big, big thing and make it work. So, in, this has actually been done in the world of constructible sheaves by... So, there's, there's two papers by Yifeng Liu and... I'm forgetting his first name. Wei Zhe Zheng. So, they, they did it. Uh, they constructed this of upper shriek. So, it, it is a functor. You're taking schemes, almost a finite type. It's a functor to digicat. Okay. Derived schemes, okay. Yes, so, yeah, according to my conventions, I don't even say that they're derived, so they are. So, I'm currently writing a book with Nick Rosenblum where uh, we'll give a larger framework for the, to this construction. So, I'll be very happy if you ask me a question about this, but maybe in question time. So, in this way, this looks like a construction, but in fact, um, you can state and prove of, of the existence of the uniqueness theorem. So it won't be some arbitrary thing. So you can make a statement that such a functor exists and is unique given some more structure. And again, I'll be very happy to talk about it, but not in the kind of main time of the lecture. All right. So now I want to go a few more steps in this direction. So, we know what upper shriek is on, on schemes. So then I claim that we can actually extend it automatically to pre-stacks. So, let me be slightly technical. So, I'll talk about pre-stacks that I call locally almost a finite type. Left. So, and these are by definition, these are contravariant functors. I'm taking affine derived schemes that are what we call eventually co-connective, the finitely many cohomologies. And these are arbitrary functors from this to groupoids. So this is kind of, these are before we define just pre-stacks to be arbitrary functors from all affine schemes to groupoids, and here I'm cons considering these guys, I just didn't want to lie, so I'm giving this formal definition. So it, these left pre-stacks are actually a full subcategory among, among all pre-stacks. So there is a fully faithful embedding, however, it's not either a light, right adjoint or left adjoint, anything. So, it takes little thought to say what it is. And again, I would be happy to say it, but again, in question time. Just, just you don't need it for this lecture, but just I want to say that uh, this notion, this notion are connected. So, I'll now extend int co to a functor from all, from, from schemes to pre-stacks, to DJ cat, so, and it'll be the same procedure as, as how we extended Quasico from schemes to stacks, namely, so, int co of a pre-stack y will be the limit over, well, it's the same procedure, int co of s. 
So now we can talk about int colon on pre stacks. So let me give an example. It'll be a test of alertness to see if you guys are asleep. So for example, I'll say the D modules on the scheme X are int co. So last time we introduced to any scheme, we introduced X DRAM. It was a pre stack such that, so let me remind that home from S to X DRAM was by definition home from S reduced to X. So this is a pre stack, and I'll say that D modules on X are by definition int co of that. Ar arbitrary. Are people happy or not? What? Wait, are we supposed to be, is this supposed to be a test of whether we're awake or is that coming back? No, 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 it's, it's, it's supposed, it's already attested if you're awake or not. Yeah, so this is already supposed to provoke some reaction. <laughs> so let me, okay, let me give you, so let me say what, what should have aroused your suspicions. So last week we gave a, defini a different definition of DMOD. So this is today. Yes, last week we, we gave a different definition. We said that it's quasi co. Okay, so you can ask what's going on. Why am I changing from here to here? And you can ask, are they the same actually? Or, or what? Okay, so let me explain what's going on here. So there are two more pieces of that data. So note that on an affine scheme, if you consider perfect complexes, this is a monoidal category, you can tensor them up, and you can tensor coherent sheaves by perfect sheaves. Yeah, just tensor up. And you can index tended, and you'll have an action of this monoidal category on this category. And the way the definitions work for quasi-co for int-co the same will be true that on any pre-stack, quasi-co will act on int-co. This is on the one hand. On the other hand, so if you have any scheme or stack, there is a... Oops, sorry. There is a canonical map to the point, and you define the dualizing to be the pullback, of course. And so using these two pieces of structure, you define a functor, I'll call it upsilon, for any y, it's a functor that goes from quasi-co of y to int-co of y. namely action on the dualizing, F maps to F tensor omega Y. So for any pre-stack, you have a map from quasi-co to int-co, and the theorem is that if Y is Durham of anything for any pre-stack, well, within our finite type world, then this epsilon is an equivalence. So what is o uh, omega? Uh, upper shriek from the point. We now have the formalism, so we can upper shriek. And so uh, why is a uh, is any so y is obtained from a completely arbitrary pre stack by taking the ram uh, so the drum is in a sense smooth yeah? the ram is smooth let me put it like this and if y is a scheme then 
epsilon y is an equivalence if and only if the scheme is smooth. So for schemes, this epsilon is equivalent only for smooth guys, but the Durand thing is smooth. Uh, smooth means classical and classical and smooth. So why is it, is it derived? Why is a derived scheme and this functor will be an equivalence only if y is, if and only if y is classical and smooth in the usual sense. And so just a moment about the upper shrek. So you said that you can define it for... for Any morphism. Between Any pre-stacks. Pre-stack. So I've, I've extended, so I had my functor defined on schemes, and then what I do is technically, so I gave a formula what int co is on a pre-stack, but I, this formula has a name, it's called the right con extension. I extend from schemes to pre-stacks in some automatic way, and I obtain a functor from pre-stacks to DG categories. Yes, yes. Relative to no, but shriek, yeah, everything with respect to shriek pullback. No, because I, I, if you have a morphism, because I understand that I the point that the shrieks don't pull back right. I mean, okay, uh, I think I understand your question. I'll explain. So I think here is what Offer is protesting against. This has nothing to do with uh, pre-stacks. You can ask this question about schemes. So. Say we have a morphism of schemes, and then you have the following guys. There is quasi-co of x, there is quasi-co of y, there is int-co of, of x, and there is int-co of y. So, and then there are the following operations. Here, there is a usual star pullback. Here, there is this function epsilon, tensoring up by the dualizing. Here, there is an epsilon for y, and here is the shriek pullback. The claim is that this diagram commutes. In co y. Uh, so the shriek is the final in co yes. of? Schemes, but then by extension, any pre-stacks. But when you say, when you take the, the derived kind of inverse limit of int co s, yes. this is, means that if you have s prime going to s, you are using the functor int co s to int co s prime, which is the usual pullback. Upper shriek. Which is the which upper is shriek. Ah, only so upper shriek. Stuff. Yeah, it's the upper shriek that I said that I erased this blackboard. I said that upper shriek is by the work of. Uh, Liu and Zhang, upper shriek is defined as a functor from, from cat the category opposite of affine schemes, almost affine type to DG categories. No, but this was for a lattice shift. This was for no, no. So they did it for lattice shifts, but the same construction works for int co. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. So the limb is not, okay. is not relative to, to it's up, upper shriek. But uh, it seems that. When you defined in previous lectures what was int co, it was lim, I don't remember now. It was... Correct, and I'll, I'll comment in a second. <laughs> so it's another notion of int co? No, they are equivalent. I'll, 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 I'll explain it in a moment. So that's where we're going in a second. Okay. If y is a regular smooth scheme, so what are the two categories? As I say. Not derived, something yeah. very simple. So, we'll what Let is the statement? What does it mean? I will I'll explain it in a moment. Let me just do it right now. Is the omega? <laughs> yeah, omega is what you think it is. So let me, so, let's recall what happened. So, so that's another moment of test, to test your awakeness. So let's live in the world of, of schemes. I just said that if you have a scheme X, you have this functor omega X from quasi co to int co.
So this is the functor and it's tensoring by the dualizing. It should arouse in you in the sense that we are in a zoo. So do you, do you know what I mean? Well, I claim that we already had a bunch of functors between these two categories before. So, so what we said that always you have this functor in this direction and if x was eventually co-connected you also had a functor that I call xi. And here I come and I say that in addition to all of this you also have this functor. And what is going on? Well, indeed, you have all of these guys. Uh, and so, well, you have all of these guys and there are different functors. Um, okay, but what, what, what are the... <laughs> yeah, okay, so... <laughs> the simplest example. possible case, the affine line. Yeah, example, if x is smooth, so then let me say that these, let, well, the way we set up int co, it will be just the same as quasi co. There is no difference. So xi x equals mega is, is the identity functor. Nothing is going on. In this case, this functor is tensoring up by the dualizing line. Epsilon. by the canonical bundle. Shifted to the right. Sh canonical bundle uh, shifted so it's the dualizing, shifted to the m minus the dimension of, of x. So, Over actually asked another question. He detected a discrepancy in how I set up int co on in the case of algebraic stacks. Let me suppress that for a moment because it'll, it'll take me too far afield. Again, it'll be a question that I'll be very happy to answer um, kind of in question time. So, so we, have this, we have all this zoo. And let me just say that <coughs> it's only this, this functor that actually makes sense for arbitrary pre-stacks. So these guys are actually a feature of schemes and it's this guy that it's, it's extends to arbitrary pre-stacks. So kind of this is the more, fundamental of, um, the more fundamental functor. And here I stated the theorem that this functor is an equivalence on anything which is the RAM. <coughs> If x is a lo uh, locally complete intersection scheme, I mean defined by one equation in a smooth Great. one, then it's already interesting. Yes. So in this case, and uh, yes, and actually I should have said this. Okay. So we have these two categories, and now there are two functors. There's this xi and there is the epsilon. And you can ask how are they different? And they differ by tensoring by a line bundle. So if it's local complete intersection, this dualizing still makes sense, it's a line, and these are two functors from one category to another, and they are not the same, but they differ by tensoring by line. So that's how it looks like. We just ask, <coughs> yes. uh, so the Durham is a pre-stack, yes. but is it ever anything else? Is there any, are there any conditions under which it's, it's, uh, no, it's, 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 it's never represented? No, it's Cotangent complex is zero. Cotangent complex. So on any pre-stack you can talk about the cotangent complex, and and for der anything which is Durham, this cotangent complex is zero. Because the cotangent complex is tested by ma mapping infinitesimal thickenings to your stack. And the RAM is set up in such a way that doesn't feel any nilpotence. So to define the cotangent complex on the, the stacks, is, this is a, it's a very general kind of stack. Yeah, so cotangent complex is defined in, this, in the way we, we talked about in the first lecture. You're taking this 
square zero extensions and you're mapping. Ah, and you interpret the right okay, the highest Yes, thank you. But this condition is not sufficient, though. For example, it's zero, it's not equivalent. It is. It is? Yeah. All right. Isn't the RAM of the six will be gay? The RAM of the RAM is... The RAM, the RAM of the RAM is the RAM. Yeah, because zero is the RAM. Okay. So, let me just summarize what just happened. What just happened was a crash course on Upper Shriek. So now I'm coming back to the notion of singular support, and I want to comment on what, how it behaves with respect to up, Upper Shriek. Again, the reason I want to do it, again, because we're looking at this diagram, Loxis parabolic, Loxis for the levy, Loxis for G. This is, we call it P spectral, this is Q spectral. And our Eisenstein functor, I spectral, was the composition of Q spec upper shriek. And last time I said that we'll have to talk about it, and now we have it. With P spec int co lower star. And what I wanted to explain is that, that this functor maps the category, so it maps int co nilp on log sys m to int co nilp log sys g. What we did explain last time was the following. We did a half of it. We introduced, so, int co nilp on loxis p and explained that the direct image maps it um, to intco nilp loxis g. Today I want to explain the second part. I want to explain that q spec upper shriek maps um, intco nilp loxis m to intco nilp loxis p. Just, just the other half of what I did last time. Okay, let me first remind you where this came from. This was a general assertion. It's not specific to int codes. It's something general about singular support. So, So, reminder, so let x to y be a map between quasi-smooth schemes. So then we have this functor of int code direct image on the one hand, and also we have this correspondence sing y over y, it maps to sing x and it projects down to sing y. And I call this map uh, sing of f. So the theorem from last time was the following. So fix n sub x inside sing of x and s n of y inside sing of y and assume 
that uh, if you take the singular co-differential, the sing of f, take the pre-image of nx, <coughs> it will be, will be contained in ny. So in this case, the claim was that this direct image maps int co an x on x two int co and y on y. So it maps this subcategory to this subcategory. That was the theorem from last time. So now I want to state the corresponding result for upper shriek. So let me ask some student. Who will volunteer the theorem for me? Uh. Lost the chalk. So, so same circumstances, nx and xy. So when does f up a shriek send int co and y y to int co no upper upper shriek. Yeah, yeah. So given it's called non characteristic. Okay, so Pierre wants to give an answer, please. Give me, so it has to do with the singular. No, give me the answer. It happens. In fact, it will be if and only if, but uh, give me sufficient condition. The kind of transversality. Transversality will be some other place. You'll see, we'll, we'll get there in a second, just in one minute. It's not transversality, it's containment. It's some estimate from above. So anybody? Yeah, so an X should contain something, yeah? Y yeah, kind of. We want this to be small as compared to this. Like, the bigger an X is, the easier it is for this to, to hold. So what's your estimate? That's, that's too... So X to Y is a map of... Of, uh, of quasi-smooth schemes. No, because in D-module theory, there is a way to pass from a subset of T star Y to... Yes, there will be some... Th there, will, there is a parallel assertion about D-modules, right. You can estimate the characteristic variety of upstairs in terms of the downstairs. So give me the analogous thing here. So what if you have a D-module downstairs, if you want its uh, singular support of its pullback to be contained somewhere, what's your condition? No, no, not transversal. Containment. Transversal will be in a moment. No, if it's the same thing, you maybe take pull back or back. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same thing in the opposite direction. Yeah. So theorem. Uh, so this happens. when provided that containment, just in the opposite direction, that n y y is small enough as compared to mm, n x, i.e. something is contained in the inverse image of something else, if sing f of this is contained in an X. Same condition, just re invert the containment. And it's an exercise applied to the morphism Q and obtain this containment. Deduce <coughs> from theorem. But 
here we wanted more. So we wanted this functor i's not only to respect singular supports, we actually wanted to send coherent things to coherent things. We wanted to preserve compactness. For this p spec lower star, it happens because the morphism was proper. Now we are doing this q upper shriek, and up upper shriek will not in general preserve coherence. You're doing upper shriek. Like if you have a singular variety and a point mapping to it, I, if you do upper shriek, well, you'll, you'll get all the x's. There'll be, there'll be infinitely many of them. So it's not, doesn't preserve coherence. So, so you can, you may want, in these circumstances, ask, so when is f up a shriek of f coherent if f was coherent? And this is, um, well, Pierre was saying transversality, this will be transversality. So we can actually give a criterion when coherence will be preserved in terms of singular support. This is, in term, this is now for, for, uh, a for map stacks or for, 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 for quasi map, map between quasi-smooth schemes. Uh, pardon? No. Uh, this is what you're saying is too weak. We can, give a, we can give a finer condition. Let me do something more general. Well, after all, upper shriek is a version of tensor product. Let me just say something more general for tensor products. So here's a theorem. So X is quasi-smooth. And F1 and F2 are coherent sheaves. So then the following are equivalent. So one is that if you take the usual tensor product, of course, derived one is coherent. I mean, coherent means it has finitely many cohomologies. B, you can take their shriek tensor product. By this I mean, so what's tensor product? It's upper star under the diagonal map of the external tensor product. This will be upper shriek is coherent. Then it will be internal home in either direction is coherent. D, internal home in the opposite direction is coherent. So what is the tensor upper? Shriek, you take F1 times F2 on X times X, and you shriek pull back with respect to the diagonal map. And of course, this is all boring, but all of it is equivalent to the following. Namely, you take the singular support of F1. It's a subset inside Sing. You take the singular support of F2, it's a sub-thing inside Sing, you intersect and you want it to be zero section. Now, for, for a map between uh, usual schemes, yeah. if it is local complete intersection, then, or even finite all dimension anyway, then the F upper shriek sends bound current to bound current. Yes. Now, in your context, let us say that you have usual uh, complete intersections. Of course, the map between them is not necessarily complete intersection. Exactly. So, uh, your condition uh, in this case is not, it's, it's, it's non trivial. So, you didn't state exactly the condition. Uh, so, I, stead, I stated something more general. Instead of taking upper sh pullback, I, I, I talked about tensor product of sheaves. So, you can this pullback can be expressed in terms of the tensor product. You mean the pullback? Uh, the sh shriek pullback can be expressed in terms of this kind of tensor product, and star pullback can be expressed in terms of this kind of tensor product. On some something else. On something else. I'm currently I'm, I'm blanking on what. I think on x times on x times y or something like this. On x times y, because you. Correct to x times y. Yes, on x times. Yeah. So you will be you'll be doing F tensor, the structure sheaf, you'll be tensoring with the, with the structure sheaf of the diagonal, something like that. Or shrinking to the diagonal, something like that. So I'm saying that if you know this, you can give a criterion for when 
coherence is preserved. In this theorem, is it uh, always the equivalent to the dual? There is a dual? There is, there is, there is serialty, yes. So it's equivalent, it's yeah. isomorphic to dual functional? Yes, so I mean... This is isomorphic to yes. dual so f1 tensor f2? Yes, it's isomorphic to df1 tensor f2. But I think that for Schrick, you have to Schrick pull back to the product. If you take the tensor product is dualizing, then Schrick by the diagonal. Yes, yes, I, that's what I'm saying. That if you want, if you talk about alpha Schrick, you, you'll be using point B of the theorem. But not the structure sheet, but the... Dualizing, dualizing. yes. For, for quasi-smooth, it doesn't matter because the dualizing is a line bundle. And then the singular support that you will, use, you will be using is on x cross y. Yes, but because the other thing is, is just the dualizing, its singular support will be zero times the singular support of the original thing. But no, when, when you have usual schemes, you could use, you, your singular support was using the fact that it is... That quite it smooth. Is, that, it is quite, that it uses the... For usual schemes, there is no... There is no what is the singular support for usual uh, complete intersection? It's the same as uh, you regard the usual complete intersection as derived one, yes. and you create its, its sing, and it's a subset there. Usual case is a particular case of this. So it's, it's a subset of the... So maybe, let me, maybe it'll be easy if I just give it, the, if they write the formula. So... So, you know what, I'll write this formula. I don't want to do it while I'm standing, I'll do it during the break. So I said that you can give a criterion, deduce this criterion from here, I'll, I'll do it, but let me not do it just standing up. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so this is, well, these two theorems are kind of basic, basic functoriality properties of, in, of singular support. So that's how they behave with respect to push forwards and pullbacks. All right, so. But your Eisenstein thing, so if I take G equal GL2, uh, yes. the, the bo a parabolic is a Borel, so M is a torus, so I take a local, uh, unlock the sink of the torus, so it's not so complicated, I take the punctual sheaf. At some point, yes. wha what is the image? Ah, you asked this question before. Yes, but I, yeah. uh, at least on on uh, an open subset, uh, an open sub uh, something of uh, Loxy, and the curve is of genus bigger than two, so there is a, a irreducible uh, local system, for example. Let me understand the question again. So you take uh, the nicest open subset that you like, uh, you prefer, of log, sys log system of G. OK, so we want to do the computation. So you're starting with sigma. It's a point in log sys t, log sys t, torus. Yeah, a particular point, skyscraper. OK, let's be careful. So in our category, nilp is 0 for the torus, right? So this is actually in quasi co. Log sys t. I.e. int co nilp. But that was zero. Okay, we start with this, and then we do Eisenstein. And you restrict it to a nice. Yeah. So and this is this is an object of int co. Loxus G. It's a particular object there. So so let's ask a question about it. So what kind of question would you like to ask? So there is a very interesting question that one can ask. But okay, so I'll let you ask a question. So we get we get a well-defined object. So there is an open subset where nil is zero. Yes. Um, yeah, it's a substack. Yes, indeed. So, and it's easy to say what it is. It's um, either the local system is reducible, or when it is reducible, these two one-dimensional guys are non-isomorphic. This is open subset. On that open substack, this int co nilp is just quasi co. 
and then what, what you get is what you think you'll get. So it'll be just direct image. Well, I mean, th there can't be anything because you're just dealing with the usual quasi code. But on the interesting subset where NILP is not zero, you're getting some phenomenon. And you asked this question before, so... Yeah, okay. no, okay. no, no, you asked a bunch of years ago with this, there was this mystery of Eisenstein and it's, that's where it lies. And it's exactly... This mystery of Eisenstein has to do with, remember I wrote this treacherous diagram that one diagram did not commute, it has to do with that. All right, so... If you take the constant uh, sheaf on O, on... Luxus. On lux of T. Mm -hmm. Again, so y there will be a phenomenon, so it's... On the open part where nilp is zero, you, got, you will not get anything interesting, but then something will happen. Okay, so I think I should make a break. So let me just say what I had in mind for the last hour. There are two themes that I wanted to cover. And I think realistically I, only ha I will only have time for one of them. So let me just say what these are. So theme number one is the following. So we said that if f is a intercoherent sheaf, you can assign to it its singular support of f, which is a subset. It's really, it's really a subset. There's no scheme theoretic structure. But you can ask, is there a scheme theoretic structure? Can you do something slightly better? So and let, let me tell you what, ki what kind of better thing one can do. So let me consider an object not an int co, but let me quotient int co by quasi co. It's called the category of singularities. So in general, if you have a, I'll denote this with a circle. So it's int co modulo quasi co. So, well, by the same analysis, well, same principle to it, you can attach an object in the projectivization of the thing. Is it a subcategory of the Both. Remember, so we had this adjunction. So, so you can think of this quotient as either the kernel of this functor or the quotient by the image of this functor. It's the same. And the image, this is fully faithful? This is fully faithful. Yeah. You can take this and modulo the image of this functor, or it's the same as the kernel of that functor. In fact, there's a picture that you can create in form of things in co of, of perfect complex and some on something else. Something name, and co, quasi co has things to support on something else. So, quasi co get supported on the zero section, therefore if you take an object of the quotient, it will have a well-defined support on the projectivization. So, let me say, to this you can assign, let me say, singular support with a circle of F, which is a subset in this projectivization. But, so, what you do have, you have more. So here you have not exactly scheme theoretic structure, but you have the following piece of structure. So there will be the following theorem. You consider the category of D modules on this projectivization. And this category, it's a monoidal category. And now we remember what I talked about in the beginning. So it's a monoidal category in the world of DJ categories. As such, it will act on this category of singularities. So not only do you have in this dumb, dead way singular support, something acts on something. And so, and this is actually of central technical importance for, for Langlands. And I can explain that. So it kind of, it's a central result that allows you to do things. So this is theme number one. And theme number two is the following. It has to do with local Langlands. So local Langlands is still very highly conjectural. We don't, unlike 
global language, we don't have a statement. But we kind of know what it's supposed to be. So it's supposed to compare the following. So global language was an equivalent of a pair of categories. This category was supposed to be equivalent to this one. Local language is supposed to be an equivalent between a pair of two categories. These two categories are supposed to be equivalent to these two categories. So what are they? One is categories equipped <coughs> with an action of the loop group. But you always say that your categories are infinity categories. Yes, yes. I mean, it's a DG categories equipped with pieces, stru pieces of structure. When I say category, I mean DG category. But when you say two, two categories, no. So like these guys together form a two category, an infinity two category. The totality of these forms an infinity two category. But I don't know, because the two, there was this uh, idea that an infinity category just uh, extrapolates two categories. I mean, like no, 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 it's different. The word two means that I allow non-invertible two morphisms. There, there is no book about this. There is, there is book in the, in the process. Ah, okay, so I understand that what Lurie did is this invertible higher model. Yeah, You're, Lurie did infinity one categories, and these guys are infinity two categories. So it's going to be twice as long or infinite? Yeah, more yeah. is more in the former space. Yeah, so this may be not so bad. Okay, so this is the geometric side, and here it will be categories well, let me say it again. Don't understand it technically yet. Sheaves of categories over local systems with respect to Langlois dual group on the formal puncture disk. And, and again, it's a mess. So I've been working for many years trying to make sense of what it is. But even if I am able to make sense of it, what it is, this cannot hold for the same reason as the global guy was wrong, namely here, there is more stuff than here. So there are, there's a phenomenon of Whittaker degeneracy. The index subscript of proxies. G check, Langlands dual. The shift of categories means a kind of DG category. Yeah, I look, so let me just, if I'll go in either this direction or this direction the next hour, and then I'll, I'll explain whatever I can explain. So, but what I want to mention is that if we man manage to do this, it's still, wrong because we have to account for the same phenomenon. In the global case, we had to replace quasi-co of log cis. We have to make this replacement of int co nilp. So we enlarge the spectral side and then it had a chance to be um, equivalent to the geometric side. So here, so sheaves of categories over a pre-stack, you can think of it as some kind of categorical, two categorical quasi-co. <coughs> so then we should be able to also somehow enlarge it to some version in categorical. And the only problem is that no one knows how to do it. So in the case of Quasico, you said, okay, you just take coherent sheaves, incomplete, and that's your guy. Here, it's just completely not clear. Incomplete, uh, it's just completely not clear. So, see, this is a two category, and then you're enlarging this two category. And the worst is that, let's just relax for a moment. So, I'm sure you guys have seen two categories in your lives. But all the two categories that I've seen are of the following sort. It's a cat, it's a, each two category has the following shape. It's a, it consists of categories equipped with, ex, with, an extra, with extra structure. It's categories with, with extra structure. So any two category that I've seen in my life comes equipped with a forgetful functor to the two category of categories. Well, if you can think of any other, please let me know, but I haven't seen one. So, see, we've seen categories that are not equipped with natural functor to sets. So, and that's why I was... So, so, yeah, we know categories that are not sets with extra structure. Like sheaves on the, on the manifold, it's not a set with extra structure, it's more. 
and plenty of other examples. But locally, you, you usually want to limit uh, the level in some sense. So uh, your locks, you, you don't ask a regular singularity? No, I don't. Even if I did, it would be the same problem. Yeah, okay, but at least... It's <laughs> I can do it, but I mean, it's... So these are... Oh, yeah, these are technical problems of this, but even if I resolved all of these, it will still be not enough for the following reason that I'm creating a two category without, and this, ca this big two category is really doesn't have a forgetful functor to, to the two category of categories. Yeah, but if you bound the level, if you take a, a simple level, mm -hmm. like Iwori level or something, you can expect that you know the answer in some sense. I know. From the point of view of uh, local long lines. Uh, yes. What is two quasi coherent to in quasi? So then you should yeah, be able to. Because these big things are in that kind of okay. manageable stuff. Yeah, so, so all I want to say is that there are two options for the next hour, and I would like to know which ones of which one would you like to me to go to? Yeah. Demodulus. One. Hmm? Demodulus. One? One, one, yeah. Two. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to go to the next one. Okay, I mean, which one was supposed to be in the first weeks? Then come on. Let's do it. That one. <laughs> okay, so um, we can take a vote and then I can do in question time, I can do uh, the other. Which one? What is question time? <laughs> uh, there is this kind of note. <laughs> At T. Okay, let's let's take a vote. Who wants one? Le premier? Le premier? Le deuxième? Okay, so who wants two? <laughs> Seems like there is there is parity. <laughs> so, okay, let's take five minutes. So, one is. It's content of another paper with Arinkin. It's called um, uh, The Category of Singularities and Global Springer Fibers. Okay, so I said that I'll talk about the following. The D modules on the singular, the projectivization of the sing act on the category of singularities. But I will start not from here, I will I was motivated by Langlands. I'll, I'll say what problem we were, we were solving and then how that, that thing came up. So let me remind you uh, something that I stated at the end of last time. So we said that you take all these spectral Eisenstein series functors and you apply them to Quasico. Don't even do the modification. So this quasico sits inside INCO. You get some collection of objects inside INCO NILP and see what these guys gen generate. So the theorem was that what they generate is exactly INCO NILP of LOXIS G. Okay. Now let's take a look what it me what it means to generate. Suppose, as usual, you have a pair of adjoint functors, f and g. So the lemma is that the image of f generates g. Uh, you can see this particular case m equal to g, including m equal to g the bulk. So the image of f generates d if and only if the functor g is conservative. Conservative in the world of dg categories means just it doesn't send anything to zero. Pardon? Except zero. But so you can imagine that to prove something this conservativity would not be enough. So kind of what we want to do, we want to turn this kind of statement that some functor g is actually fully faithful. So this is, so d will be this, int co. <coughs> so we want to map this category fully faithfully into something that has to do with 
quasi-coast but on parabolics. And so that's, this, is what, this is where we are going. So, okay, now a scary creature will appear. So don't be afraid. Okay. Say I have a morphism f, f from x to y. I want to talk about so who remembers what de how do we how do we define d modules on x? But what on x the ram? Int co or quasi co? Yeah. So either and it it doesn't matter. But say I want to define relative d modules. I want kind of quasi coherent sheaves or incoherent sheaves. I don't know on x with a connection along the fibers. How do you define that? Okay, give me, give me the definition. So vertical D modules on X with respect to the map are We'll then figure out if you want quasi co integral, give me the geometry. It'll be sheaves on what? Locally facing some fiber, yeah. But the fiber is nasty. You can think like you can take a point mapping to y or something. Map both of them to the ram and take the fiber. Board. Yes. So you're considering this creature, x the ram over y the ram with y. So this kind of thing. Okay. Now, what do you want to consider? Quasi co int co. Well, the claim is that you actually want to consider both. Uh, I have two things because on the, on the result of direction, I have two possibilities. Yeah. So you see, if x will equal to y, this is just x. So and we know that there is a canonical map, this epsilon. And well, you can show that in this case it's a fully faithful embedding. But what happens is that the category that we're actually interested in is in between. It is genuinely in between, and neither nor. So note that there is a map from here uh, from y to this thing. Uh, for the moment, not, but soon it will be. Sorry, there is a map from x to here. So therefore, there is now we'll. So that's why I talked about the shriek pullbacks, and that's why I preferred theme one because we're going to use what we talked, what we developed about the shriek pullbacks. So shriek pullback defines a map from here to int co x. Shriek pullback with respect to this map. Kind of think of it, forgetting the connection. Forget relative D modules, suggest all modules. Now let's assume that X and Y are quasi smooth. Again, assume X and Y are quasi smooth. In this case, there is, well, also known as quasi coherent sheaves on X. Things with zero singular support. And let's define this as the pre image. So these are those objects here, such that they forget the connection, they have zing zero single support. <coughs> and it's fairly easy to see that the image of this functor actually lies in here. So there is quasi-co, there is int-co, and there is something in between. And it turns out, I'll say in the, explain in a moment, that this is the beast we're interested in. And let me give it a name because it's too much notation. Let me call it i x over y. Okay, and so what we're going to do, we're going to consider this morphism, log sys p to log sys g. And we are interested, I claim,
with this fellow. So you can ask, why are we interested in this fellow and not in some other fellow? The reason is that, so we are still trying to prove Langlands, and well, what you want to do, you want to translate things from the spectral side to the geometric side, and it turns out that this guy, if you assume Langlands, well, if you assume induction, this guy can be translated to the, well, can be fully faithfully embedded into something explicit on the geometric side. So let me just say that by induction on semi-simple rank, this category fully faithfully embeds into what's known the p-degenerate Whitaker category. You don't have to understand what this p-degenerate Whitaker category is. I'm just saying this to explain why I'm interested in this category. Okay, so these are my building blocks. And so let me state the theorem, and then I'll explain th its meaning. So the theorem will look as follows. It will say that a certain functor from intco nilp on loxis g to, well, I want to take them all of them together, and I'll write the following symbol. I'll write, write glue. These categories. Where P runs through the pole set of parabolics of G. So the theorem is that is fully faithful. So what I have to explain is that what do I mean by this glue? And what is the functor? What does it have to, and what does it have to do with the theorem of the corner? Um, so, well, um, so it's kind of easy to see that for the left adjoint, what the essential, what's generated by the essential image of this is the same as what's generated by these guys. So the generation is the same, but I'm getting something fully faithful. And so this theorem is central to Langlands because, well. Wait, what is the glue? That's yes, that's, this is what I'll explain. On the geometric side, for GLN, we have an analogous embedding of D of Bungi onto glue. Well, we have a map in general, glue, and it'll be this with degenerate Whitaker guys. So we have a functor in general. It's known to be fully faithful embedding for GLN. And if you believe what I said, you'll get a fully faithful functor in one direction. So that's kind of that's the the mechanics of the proofs of, of the proof of Langlands. So that's why we're in interested in this assertion. Kind of. So uh, so you uh you said you have also factors on the left and the right, horizontal, uh, vertical. Yeah, I will, I will not be talking about the geometric side. I'm saying that I'm just giving motivation why I'm interested in this kind of assertion. I'm interested in the assertion because I have a parallel assertion on the geometric side. I, I have a functor between these categories, which I can prove that is fully faithful. That's what I mentioned by induction on the semi-simple rank. And then I can show that if I, on the generators, if I go this way, the generators are in the image of this functor. And this gives me a functor in this direction, which is automatically fully faithful. So this, this, is, this is how the proof of Langlands for GLN goes. Just 
you will make a similar problem. Permits a similar problem? No, 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 not at all. No. So why you call this the geometric? Oh, this is this is our Langlands, right? We're trying to compare this and this. If I put Langlands dual. So we are trying to prove that this category is equivalent to this. And what I'm trying to do, I'm, I'm trying to construct a functor in one direction, and moreover, one that is fully faithful. And the way I'm doing it, I'm embedding both into some larger categories, and I'm constructing a fully faithful functor between these larger categories. But then, I still have to construct these functors. And uh, finally, it will be an equivalence? Finally, it will be an equivalence. But I mean, you, there are various stages of the proof, and this stage will show that the functor is actually fully faithful. In the glue, you, you have the P are proper, uh, proper parabolic? Or all, all. For GL2, there'll be two pieces. I have to say what glue is in a moment. But you've been insisting that the uh, cuspidal part is a boring part. Well, it's... Well, it's not, of course it's not boring. Hey, but when you say you have a map on this uh, on the right side, uh, that means that for p equals g, you are able to do something. For p equals g, what will happen is that I'm dealing with quasi-co, yeah. and so quasi-co of g. Well, okay, let me just say it again. All these are scary words. I'm not. What happens? It goes to embeds fully faithfully into the round version of representations of G-check. And this is the Whitaker category. So it's a RAN, it's a RAN version. So you're putting, again, so I don't want to, it's a, it's a, it's a category in, RAN is the person, Zivran. And it's, it's in the Whitaker, yes, the student oh. runs in oh, August. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't, do, okay. Yeah. So, so I'm, as asking, I'm answering Lamont's question why this is, f what is useful, because I mean this, this embeds into something local. Yeah, but then you have to make a link with the module. Uh, yeah, so the way you do it, you, you can exhibit generators. You mean this? Oh, so this is completely geometric. Yeah, but uh, to go in this. So you then, you... If you have a D module on Bungie, you have to produce uh, this collection of uh, representation of G. Yes, this, these are the Whittaker coefficients. So there is a functor of Whittaker model that takes, goes from here. It's a paper dedicated to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know. <laughs> so. Mm, it was just a motivation why I wanted this theorem. So let me just maybe let me just go ahead with this. I mean, of course, this language story is very interesting, but uh, okay. I will just to remove the temptation. Let me erase this. Okay. So what is glue? So here's the setting for glue. Say you have some index category A, and you have a functor from A to digicat. So to objects of A, you have some digit category C, and you have, when you have an arrow from A to B, you have functors, let me call them F A to B. So in this case, there are a couple of things you can do. One is something we've been doing all along. You can take the limit. So this is a category whose objects you, you should think of as follows. These are objects little c a for every a, and for every arrow, you, you're given isomorphisms. So the limit is just really kind of a compatible system of objects in each of your categories. But there's also another thing. It's called lax limit. And I'll explain, give an example in a moment. This is also collections of objects like this. But now, we no longer require isomorphisms. We only require maps in one direction. Which direction? In this case, this direction. And are there, two lax limit depending on the there are two. There is lax limit and, and, and the co-lax limit. If A is kind of 
two errors and one, uh, two, two vertices, one error, it would be similar to the bit of this. Yes. Ah, this is what you meant by similar to yes. yes, it will be. And this is what I call glue. And I'll exp well. Yeah, that's people also can glue the So, and let me, let me give an example, exactly Maxim's example, what I mean by glue. So consider the following example. Say A is this category. It has two objects, zero and one, and one arrow. And consider the following example of this CAs. Let Y be a topological space, and Y0 be an open, and Y1 will be a complementary closed. So C0 will be sheaves on Y0, again, I mean derived category. C1 will be sheaves on Y1, and the functor 0 to 1 will be I up a shriek, J low a shriek. So then I claim that this glue um, sheaves yi will be sheaves on y itself. So all I'm saying, the sheaves on y are glued in precisely in this sense in term from sheaves on the strata. It's not a limit, it's the lax limit. So, so this is what I mean by the right-hand side. But there is also a classical way to do it with I F L star J loss. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then it will be arrows in the opposite direction. So it will be collax. It will be collax. I, I wrote this example because I wanted the arrow in this direction. So here it's a derived category. Yes. Because here there is a shift implicitly. No, 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 there's no shift, but it's as, as written, but I'm, uh, when I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing derived categories. The functor is, the functor is as written. Ah, okay, so then you glue the restriction of the shift to y1 and the shriek of the shift to y0. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> but then you take all the parabolics around? I take all the par... Oh, no, no. Post set of standard parabolics, conjugate parabolics. standard conjugate class of parabolics. Uh, you take one for every yeah. conjugate, conjugate class. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a finite post set. Mm -hmm. All right, so if you can take bo uh, both, no? you can also take them all no? yeah. and become. <laughs> yeah. So this is what I take. So. So this is what I mean by glue. Let me say what this functor is. So if you look at the definition of what it means to glue, what I have to do, have to produce a family of functors, loxus G, to these categories that are not compatible under pullbacks, but they are lax compatible. So I don't need if I go from one parabolic to another, I want, don't want the functors to strictly compose. I, want, I need them to compose up to, up to natural transformation. So let me say what these functors are. So the functor is the following. I go from int co nilp log sys g. I even forget that it was nilp. I embed it into the whole thing. Then I do up a shriek to int co loxis uh, loxis p deram over loxis g deram loxis g. Oops, problem. Oh, I've gotten here. I wanted to land in the subcategory. What do I do? Wait. No, I landed. No, I'm not here. I'm here. I really land here. 
What do I do? A joint. <laughs> so, so, and then you, it's a joint. What's called I log sys P over log sys G. So, if I didn't have the adjoints, I will land in the strict limit. But because I have these adjoints, uh, strictness is broken and I only have natural transformations. So, these are my functors. And the theorem says that this, this the functor into the glued category is a fully faithful embedding. Okay, so uh, in the remaining 15 minutes, I'll try to explain the why what I said about D modules helps to prove this theorem. So how does it <coughs> construct the adjoint? Oh, it, it exists. It's the right adjoint. It automatically exists. By general string. By general Lurie stuff. And moreover, it's continuous because this function sends compacts to compacts. This embedding. Yeah, and it's all of these categories are compactly generated. You mean the Schrick is with respect to the projection? Yeah, so there is a map from here, this stack maps to Y. Oh, I, yeah, yeah, you take the projection? Yeah, yeah, the projection, yeah, no, just pull back. So it is a left adjoint or a right adjoint? Right adjoint. So right adjoint. Left adjoint does not exist. You said that sometimes you have a joint on both sides, but one of them is not continuous. So this is right a joint. It is continuous because the initial functor sends compacts to compacts. Yes. Okay. So. So. I would like to explain not the proof, but the idea of the proof of this theorem. And that idea is the following. So I mentioned the following theorem that there is <coughs> a canonical action of D mod projectivization, I mean, let's say, sing of Y on int co with a circle of y, which is by definition the cat what's called the category of singularities. And again, here, so now I'm going to use what I said before, that this procedure of tensoring up. So here are the features. In terms of this action, I can say, I can express the singular support. So for that m b a closed subset inside this projectivization, well, I can take int co with a circle with supports in M on Y. So before, to a subset in Sing itself, we attached a subcategory. But now I'm taking a subset in the projectivization and this subcategory will live in the category of singularities. So this category turns out to be we can express it in terms of this action. Namely, you take the entire guy and you tensor over D mod on the projectivization with D mod on M. So there is a restriction map from M sits inside this projectivization. There is a restriction map, tensor up, and you, you recover what the category with given supports is. This is point A of the theorem, and point B of the theorem pertains to that situation when we have not just y, but x over y. We leave that for a second. So let me also introduce the notation i naught x over y, it will be i x over y, where I kill the boring part, I kill the quasi-code part. So, 
So point B says the following. So that this category I0 can also be expressed. So again, it now will be a question to the audience. So it will be int co of y <coughs> over d mod of the same thing, sing y with what? Can you guess? So it's the difference between this and this. It's, I claim it's also gotten by this procedure of tensoring, this procedure of tensor product with something. So let me say that it's demod projectivization of something. So I want you to guess what, this what that something is. Oui, plus one. So, okay, I'll just call it, it's not cotangent, let me call it relative sing. So let me say what it is. Okay, Pierre is well equipped to answer this question. So, let's look at our picture again. So we have y to x, it maps to sing y, it maps to sing x, and here, let's take the kernel. Let me call that y over x. It's the guys here that die. And so this is what I want to put here. So this is, so this is a map, it's a fiber-wise linear map, and I'm taking its kernel. I e, so I'm taking the pre-image of the zero section. Oh, sorry, it's x over y. So, this is what this category looks like. So, I want to say how this kind of thing helps to prove the theorem written on the blackboard. Well, you prove it in several stages. First, it's quite easy to see that it's enough to prove, to mod out everything by quasi-co. So it's really enough to prove this. How does sin y over y cross over x, y go to sin x? It's the co-differential. Like if you like look, usual differential geometry. In usual differential geometry, we have cotangent of y times cotangent of y over y with x. We have this diagram, which should be familiar. This is the just derived version. <laughs> okay, so I want to explain how this kind of thing helps to prove this kind of thing. So. So now, if you look at the left-hand sides, what you'll see is that, so now, both sides are obtained from int co log sys g by tensoring over, so loxis, over d mod sing loxis g with something. By the way, the, 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 the thing with the circle, is it a, 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 a it's the quotient. Ah, it's the quotient in both cases. I'm, in all cases, I'm killing the quasi-co. 
and that's what the circle signifies. Int co is m y a ah, is again ah, okay. Is int co m modulo plus it okay. So a claim in this both sides are obtained with something. So let me explain what these somethings are. <coughs> so on the one hand we have this projectivization of NILP. So we have D mod on the projectivization of NILP. And here it will be the category glued from the following things. Will be, it will be projectivizations of the relative sings, relative sings on loxis P, loxis G. So D modules on that. So we've replaced the original statement that some functor that has to do with int co about a functor that only has to do with d modules. The advantage of the latter is the latter statement is topological. So it's the statement is that certain homotopy types are have trivial homology. Let me say very explicitly. So so the latter statement. Is that? Yeah. Why there are several number of parentheses is not the same. It is supposed to be. No, uh, two. Put to the right. Put to the right. Put to the right. Okay. 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 The fully faithfulness is that certain. <laughs> homotopy types have trivial homology. And in the remaining five minutes, I'll say what these homotopy types are. We were so this is the first, this is the part where you actually talk about groups. About? This is the part where you talk about groups, because all, all in today's class, you haven't said anything about groups. Groups, yes. Now we'll see. So, this is homotopy types in the usual sense. Yeah, yeah absolutely. No, nothing. It's just homotopy types okay. as we know them. So, and I'll let me say very precisely what they are. So, fix a point a comma sigma in NILP. So sigma is a local system for G. So sigma G is a point in loxis G. And A, it's a section, a Durham section of the adjoint. So nilpotent endomorphism. So now let P be a parabolic. To it, you attach the following scheme, which I call global Springer fiber. Consider the following things. It'll be reductions sigma p of sigma g to p, such that this A belongs not just to the parabolic, it be be belongs to the unipotent radical. And so th then you can form a homotopy type by gluing them. And there is a, so these reductions, let me call it. And the claim is that this homotopy type has. Glue, and now you glue in the. So I'll, so. Else, so the homology or even homotopy type? Uh, we don't know. Uh, 
You don't know if it's homotypous. We don't know if the homotypous type is contractible. We know the homology is trivial. Yeah. That's ah, so you glue in the sense of doing the similar thing for spaces. Yes. So there will be a diagram of spaces. A, a strict <laughs> diagram or up to higher homotopy. In this case, the diagram will be will be. In this case, the diagram will be strict. Ah, and then there is a notion of homotopy limit. Yes, you take the co-limit. Co co limit. Homotopy co-limit. Co-limit. It's some, it's, it's some sort of push out. But it cannot it? be expressed uh, simply by using the homology of each of them and by. Um, true, yes, yes, yes. It, it, homology of a co limit yeah. is the co limit of homologies. So this. Um, it's not a great idea to do it because the way. The no, but I, I don't understand. In the notion of gluing, you said that when you glue certain categories or other things. You, you take kind of a po an object or a point in each plus morphism between images, kind of a pass. So this looks like doing homotopy <laughs> limit, not co-limit. <laughs> but now you are do saying that now that there's homotopy co-limit instead, or oh, I don't understand the analogy because. You see, so this what I call lax limit you can equally call it lax co-limit. So, um, this, so a limit really has a universal property for mapping in and co-limit has a universal property for mapping out. Right. So lax limits and co-limits, they have lax universal properties and they have both. So if you have a lax limit, you can say what it takes to map out of it is the same way as what it takes to map into it. It's just the same natural transformations. So, when you talk about lax things in this context, I could have called these guys just the same way lax co-limits. Uh, uh, in your categorical definition, uh, it's not the, the co-limit, usually the co-limit of a category, category is open, but the of object and then with morphisms to yeah. make some relation. And, and, uh, and so, and the limit is obtained by families for every, mm -hmm. uh, and so, what you, okay, maybe after every uh, Yes, yes, I can, well, I'll, 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 so I, I don't want to kind of keep people, but I mean, I'll tell you exactly which homotopy type it is. Okay. It's a, so ask a different kind of question. X is a curve over some yeah. algebra, uh, field yeah. of characters at zero in this, you have a Lie algebra and you have a parabola. You're constructing some homotopy type out of that. Can one do it without all the? Uh, can one do it just? Oh, at the end of the day, this homotopy homotopy type is very. Is, well, it's not. No, it's not something that we had seen before. But we. But, at the end of the day, after gluing, so we certainly conjecture that this homotopy type at the end is trivial. We proved its homological triviality. So you glue a bunch of spr Springer fibers for different parabolics, you glue in them some way, and the claim is that at the end of the day... No, so what, what is involved is the following. So you have a Springer fiber. Mm -hmm. Let me say it like this. So you have a datum of a local system. The datum of a local system, you can think of a curve. Uh, is just a bunch of um, a homomorphism from from the fundamental group to, um, uh, to G. So then, um, how should I say it? So if you have a, so the Springer fibers I'm talking about are the intersection of the Springer, fi the Springer fibers, you know it, plus the fixed point locus for these endomorphism acting on the flag variety. Mm -hmm. So it's these kind of things. So the curve only appears via its fundamental group, mm -hmm. namely the fixed point loci of, um, of the generators on the... Mm -hmm. mm. It seems to me that, you can, that this part you can explain without any higher category. Oh, th kind of yeah, this, this is just topology. Yeah, this part is just, you, you take a... <laughs> strict diagram of topological spaces 
the maps that are involved are not embedding. So you have to, when you're taking this co-limit, you have to take the homotopic co-limit because there's a, but the claim is if you take the homotopic limit at the end, you'll get, we conjecture it's a point. We haven't proved it, but. Um, yeah, so it depends on the risky closure of the image of the, of the fundamental group. Yeah, yes. Other groups equals the group. And, uh, yes. So you think there's some important operator. Or Correct. So for GL2, you can prove it. Well, for EGL2, this kind of thing for GL2 is a triviality. Uh, but, uh, well, there's. Well, after we massaged it up to here, it became a triviality. So when we got, so there is stuff, but it has to do with all these theorems about action of D modules. Kind of, this is a non-triviality for GL2. But this kind of statement already, when you're down to parabolics, because you only have two parabolics, it becomes very, very easy. For GL3, okay, I'm tempted to say what the diagram looks like for GL3. It looks as follows. So you consider the flag variety the complete flag variety for GL3, and then you'll see something like two P1s meeting at a point, and the, this diagram will look as follows. It'll be, the post set will, be, will look like this, zero going to one going to two, and it'll be a one map that collapses one component to a point, and it'll be another map that collapses the other component to the point. And when you glue them together, you're left only with the point. It's something like, something like that. So it's, Again, I didn't want to be very precise here. I just want to say how the statement allows you to go from incoherent sheaves to actually topology, and then you attack the problem in topology explicitly using a building or something. All right, I think my time is up.